hello everyone and welcome to the second of a three-part webinar series intended to promote ethical and non-extractive research practices. Um, our goal is to support researchers and members of our communities more broadly in building capacity toward documenting and preserving our many storied pasts and presents as MENA folks. We are delighted by the turnout and thank you so much for coming. Um, we are also very thankful to the Orfella Center and to the Center for Middle East Studies at UCSB for their partnership and support. Beyond this event, Egypt Migrations is also grateful to our donors uh, for their contributions of invaluable historical materials and indebted to financial and in-kind supporters, including the Department of History at York University, community investors, and to those who are working to make this project a success, including uh, the entire Clara Thomas Archives team, especially Michael Moyer and Katrina, Katrina cohen Plasos. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Michael Akladius, and I'm a Toronto-based uh, historian and founder and executive director of Egypt Migrations. We are joined today by um, uh, Leila, our editor, Leila Zanussi, and social media manager, Christine Alhuri. Uh, a big shout out to them and to Amy Fias, a member of Egypt Migration's Board of Directors and a co-organizer of this public facing webinar series. Um, before introducing uh, the speakers and launching into today's this, uh, vibrant discussion on community archives, I wanna take a few minutes to share with you what Egypt Migrations is, what we do and where we are headed. Um, since 2016, Egypt Migrations has served as a vehicle for the preservation and promotion of the histories and experiences of migrants from Egypt who are contributing to their host societies. Our work centers on the identification, acquisition, digitization, and production of a very large collection of historical materials, including photographs, papers, diaries, books, oral histories, and other audiovisual multimedia. We intend to illuminate the diverse histories of individuals and groups that make up the collective memory of Egypt's diasporas. Egypt Migrations is a federal non-for-profit based in Canada, committed to providing free access to source materials preserved in the first and only Egyptian immigrant archival collection housed at the Clara Thomas Archives and Special Collections at York University. It promotes education through expertly curated exhibitions, digital educational resources, and physical events and virtual initiatives such as this one. Our efforts over the past six years have spanned a range of dynamic initiatives that not only enhance Egypt Migration's historic collections and showcase these materials to the international community, but also provoke challenging questions and spark engaging dis discussions about the realities of Egypt's diasporas. We are currently embarking on an array of exciting initiatives and curating an expansive oral history uh, collection and exhibiting that to the public. We just launched our third exhibit, a set of 12 interviews curated by Alia Osman, an undergraduate student at NYU Abu Dhabi, entitled Egypt's Migrants in the Gulf. Now, pl please, when you have a chance, check out these interviews, all moving and deeply insightful as to the in-betweenness and impermanence of the labor migrant experience in the GCC. Our initiatives are guided by deep investment in exploring varied and at times opposing voices and move a step beyond the standard practice of single-sided research by producing groundbreaking deliverables across multiple geographies. Egypt Migrations is dedicated to promoting social equity, raising public awareness about Middle Eastern migrants and providing a long lasting reference for educational and social purposes. For us, the importance of preserving the histories of Egypt's diverse migrant communities and showcasing it to the public is more than just a research agenda, it is a passion. Therefore, Egypt Migration seeks to play a pivotal role in this vision of a vibrant and engaged diaspora empowered by democratic access to historical knowledge and resources. To that end, we have just acquired Coptic Voice US, a Southern California based nonprofit and are working to integrate this vibrant platform into our many offerings and initiatives. In support of that expansive vision, I invite you to visit our website, www.egyptmigrations.com, engage with our content, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, 
And if you find value in these offerings, to donate financially and to share our initiatives and publications with friends, family, and colleagues. Now, once again, thank you for joining us and for participating in the series of capacity building webinars. And without further ado, I welcome our speakers, Dr. Alda Benjamin and Dr. Christopher Grafos. Dr. Alda Benjamin is the Abi Malik Bet Youssef Faculty Fellow in Assyrian History and Senior Research Scholar at the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Prior to that, she was a fellow at the John W. Klug Center at the Library of Congress and a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pennsylvania Museum and the Smithsonian Institution. She is committed to public engagement with questions of cultural heritage and digital humanities in which she leads projects pertaining to minoritized communities. Her book, Assyrians in Modern Iraq, Negotiating Political and Cultural Space, um, uh, is um, out uh, with Cambridge University Press. And it's a monograph on 20th century Iraqi intellectual history based on extensive primary research from within the country. Drawing upon oral and ethnographic sources and archival documents in both Arabic and modern Aramaic, discovered by the author of the Iraqi National Archives in Baghdad and in private collections from the North. It explores the role of minorities in Iraq's intellectual and mostly leftist opposition. Dr. Christopher Grafos is the director of the Hellenic Heritage Foundation Greek Canadian Archives at York University. The Endeavor recently received 1.4 million in funding from the Hellenic Heritage Foundation in Toronto, Canada. And the community archive was originally called the Greek Canadian History Project and focused on preserving materials related to the Greek immigrant experience in Canada. The project also had a public history mission to share materials that would otherwise be hidden in the depths of the archives. I thank you both, Alda and Chris, for being with us and for, sh for sharing your expertise. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael, for this um, kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me and, and uh, thank you for Egypt Migrations for this important uh, webinar that you're putting together and all the uh, this work that's inspiring us to do uh, similar projects uh, in our communities. Um, I'm especially happy to be joining uh, a Canadian, to be joining colleagues from uh, Canadian institutions, proje running projects in Canada uh, and Toronto. My family immigrated uh, from Iraq uh, to Canada, and I and I also attended York University. So this is especially um, um, heartwarming for me. So thank you for this invitation. Let me go ahead and share my PowerPoint. Can you see it well? Okay. So I was really inspired by empowering counter narrative, uh, Michael and, and uh, Amy, and, and uh, this uh, the theme for this um, webinar. So I'm going to be drawing on it, um, archiving Assyria, community preservation and continuity. This is the roadmap. I really want to um, talk about some of the challenges uh, that we face with uh, collecting Assyrian archives. I think it's important, especially if we have community members either with us in when this- When did I get home? Here. I live here. In your house? What's here? Okay. Um, especially if we have um, community members with us today. Um, and uh, also focus, so, so I'll talk about challenges, approaches, and sources, and, and then focus on language as an example, uh, and then move on to um, some of the works that, um, that I'm engaged in, private archiving, uh, and, and engaging with the community. And I want to really um, stress that there are, this has been a project that Assyrians have been engaged in for generations. So, so we talk about archiving, uh, community engagement, uh, Assyrian studies is having its moment uh, and, and you know, uh, definitely it's, it's um, needed and important, but our, our, for many generations, Assyrians have been preserving and I'll uh, sort of uh, demonstrate to you uh, when I talk about language. 
So the challenges that we face really in writing, and I use quotations here, minority or minoritized community, uh, the history of these such communities or marginalized communities is that we really encounter a gap in academic scholarship. Uh, it's very difficult to find primary sources because of the displacement, uh, because of the genocide and, and, and massacres and, and movements um, that Assyrians have experienced um, at the beginning of World War I, uh, at other periods, but also because of where they live. You know, there has been uh, a rise in sectarianism, uh, Iraq in particular, or Syria as well. Uh, there's been war and violence, which has affected all communities, but of course, Assyrians as well. And not having a nation state with institutions that, uh, you know, the modern nation state really uh, invested in creating archives and in, in um, creating institutions that, that document and, and narrate a particular kind of history and collect, being a stateless nation, this become th this is a problem um, that the community has been doing, preserving on their own, uh, privately, um, in their homes, uh, smaller sort of private libraries and institutions. So and this is uh, this is important. We we need uh, to formulate new approaches in studying communities and and be wary of the archival practices, the what is available in archives. And, and you know, if we have scholars amongst us, you know, this is something I'm sure you consider when you when you think about um, writing about minoritized communities, marginalized communities. How do you really give them a voice, um, a non elitist, non male centered perspective? I have written uh, two special. Uh, I have edited two special issues. One for the Journal of Contemporary which concludes with uh, a roundtable on ethical practices um, pertaining to research in northern Iraq. Uh, and then also uh, a journal um, of international, uh, International Journal of uh, Middle Eastern Studies. Uh, I have a, I edited a roundtable with really um, an excellent group of scholars who contributed to it. In this roundtable, we talk about pluralism and minoritization, but we also talk about uh, approaches and use of sources when we uh, when we um, talk about when, when we write about minoritized communities in the Middle East. So um, Michael kindly mentioned already my book. So a lot of my research and my interest in digitizing and archiving stemmed from problems I faced as a scholar, as an as a graduate student, really um, trying to collect material on the Assyrian community. And I was hoping that I do it in a way where, you know, I um, of course, included the marginalization of the community, but also looked at their engagements in pluralistic spaces, although those spaces might have been temporary uh, and, and shifting. Um, but I wanted to, to uh, you know, oftentimes we study, we, we, we use a very sort of um, uh, top-down structural approaches, particularly when studying Christian uh, Middle Eastern communities. And I wanted to give a different perspective. Uh, oftentimes we, we look at the Assyrians from um, you know, fields such as Syriac studies, uh, linguistic studies, and, and there's a lot of important uh, studies and works done in those in those fields. But you know, given the nature of scholarship, the, the attention generally highlights, or, or rather given the nature of, of the sources used, the, the um, scholarship highlights you know, uh, religious hierarchies and, and such. Uh, so I wanted to give a different perspective. I wanted to situate Assyrians within modern Middle Eastern studies. This was the approach I used. Um, and, and, you know, um, consider bilingualism and multilingualism because the Assyrians were settled, were living their native in, in areas that uh, were peripheral um, and, and eventually with the creation of the Iraqi nation state, uh, you know, provincial. So, so the rural um, aspect of the community is important and, and as well as orality. And, and this is when I get into language. So I did a lot of research inside the country. I really had to sort of think of different ways because even when we talk about archives and I know Amy did a wonderful webinar just before this one on how to do research at archives. And many of us working on marginalized or minoritized communities know that we have to sort of think on our feet. How do we find sources? Um, sometimes there, there's a lot of problems. You know, I, I did research at the Stanford Institution um, at Stanford, uh, sorry, uh, Hoover Institution at, at Stanford University, where at the time they housed the Iraqi archives from the Ba'ath uh, Ba'ath period, and it was very. I mean, you know, they were all digitized, but the the key terms that you searched did not really include Assyrians. So. Um, I always tell the story that I had a, 
what became a, 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 a colleague, a good friend of mine, uh, Sam Helfand, who found this, um, who was also doing research at the time, found this important file, which included 20, 30 pages on the Assyrians. But in, you know, because he was searching other terms, I would not have encountered it if, if he had not told me. So there's really different ways that we all have to sort of uh, be wary of, uh, think of, um, to find sources, even when we're doing research at the archives. But the Iraqi archives was wonderful. These ladies archivists who helped me were absolutely great. I, I really encourage you all to, um, to do research in Iraq. So, um, you know, here, uh, this is a very holy site, uh, St. Hermas, uh, Rabban Hermas uh, Monastery uh, and, and graves of of men, secular men actually killed at this holy site, uh, Toma Toma. So I'll move on. I know that um, Michael said 10 to 15 minutes. I'll try to be respectful. Um, okay, why is language important? Well, because it really uh, oftentimes gives a voice to minoritized communities. You do not find them in archives and written sources, um, but it's, it's also because these communities, especially if, the, if they, have their own language, such as the Assyrians, um, they they um, have not been able to standardize. You know, uh, depending on when they were born, under what sort of regime uh, and the restrictive policies of the state, uh, they were not always able to have private schools or schools that taught in their language. That changed from period to period, but. A lot of times, and, and I'm borrowing from the work of uh, the late Amir Hassanpour, who taught at the University of Toronto. He was a Kurdish Iranian scholar um, who, who writes about the difference between uh, listening versus uh, uh, writ, uh, writing public. So, so there are communities that they can, uh, they, they speak their language, they're, they're fluent in it, but they are not able to read and write in it because they have not been able to standardize, to, to learn it in a, in a public institution. In an educational system. So this is why I think oral history um, and, and music, and I include it in my work, uh, is important. But also, you know, it, it sometimes, because of the restrictive policies and, and censorship of the say, sometimes, like in the 1970s, in music, Assyrians expect, express themselves more authentically, and that's important. Uh, so, so there's an example of the Semel song versus um, singing about the Semel massacre, for instance, a massacre from the 1930s versus writing about it in the same club, in the same sort of, uh, within the same milieu of intellectuals. They, they knew they could use these two different mediums differently. And, and the creation of a cassette tape uh, in the 1970s, the ease of its transfer from uh, borders uh, was also important. So, so that's something that I take into account. So I'll move on here. Uh, and, you know, uh, I had a postdoc uh, at the University of Pennsylvania Museum and the Smithsonian Institution, so the intangible cultural heritage sort of, you know, we call it as historians, maybe ethnographic sources or oral history, but um, all this is important when dealing with minoritized communities. Um, this this uh, gentleman, Shnimun uh, Shmuel, uh, recently passed, unfortunately, he was one of 100 families that still crafted this uh, this uh, way of, of making a certain uh, traditional clothing and he he just recently passed uh, a wonderful man I met a few times the the genocidal policy you know uh, practices uh, of you know empires um, states and, and more recently Isis uh, or Daesh have really disrupted uh, the uh, traditional ecological knowledge and, and uh, endangered the language. So the Aramaic language of the Assyrians is endangered, uh, you know, uh, according to UNESCO. So here, uh, Michael, do we have time? How am I doing for time? Okay. Maybe I'll play this clip. This is just um, this is basically an example of social memory expressed through song. This is a woman uh, who is um, survives ISIS. She's rescued uh, from the village of Karamlesh, and I, I want to just show you how powerful she is. The interviewer asks her to tell him about his experience. Instead, she sings. Um, 
مخيتا اي من داني كفار وكبو كبو فور مليتا اخ اخ تكرم لاش على مستي كرم لاش اوي اوي الخيرة غيب ناشي ويلي إلا قاشي ولا جماشي so I'll stop here and I just want to show how much influence, how much agency this woman has. She's most likely illiterate. She certainly is poor. She's not able to escape with everyone else because she does not own a car. She does not have, does not have family. Uh, but, you know, through the this medium of, of, of oral um, folkloric uh, practices, uh, that the song that she composes on the spot, I mean, he asks her, how did you how did you survive can you tell us about your experience and and she sings about it very powerfully uh and and she has an impact on all these women from her village that have reconnected um in in, a, in an uh, internally displaced camp together um uh, connecting after months of, of of separation so so this is the power of, of our oral history of of these oral traditions that were practiced um and and um passed on from family to family so um you know i just want to hear say how important language is the preservation not only of archives we also need to think about intangible heritage we need to think about not only written sources but the orality and these traditional practices that we have in in rural communities uh, and then efforts of, of their um preservations have been ongoing this is why when i started the presentation, I wanted to say that, yes, there's a lot of attention given to projects that were engaged in, but really these projects did not begin with, with myself or uh, from scholars of my generation. They've been going on um, in, in different ways uh, by, by our parents, our great grandparents, our great grandparents, they've done it in different ways. In refugee camps, they set up schools to teach the language. Um, and and uh, the history that our, has been shared and should be recorded or remembered by us. This is all important, but there's an aid society um, school. There is uh, cultural clubs that preserve language and, and technology apps that now we have, and many organizations that are also engaged in the in the documentation and the preservation of this um, of this important heritage. So um, we are actually getting textbooks uh, donated to us at Berkeley. Uh, from a Syrian aid society, uh, from Syriac schools in Iraq, Syrian schools in Iraq that were um, basically created in the early 1990s in the safe haven, which became the Kurdistan regional government. Now they're spread to other parts. Um, and in terms of private archives, what is important? Sometimes it's really important to remind families. I've done oral interviews with people who have treasures in their basement. What's important? Your pictures are important. The memoirs that your grandparents or your families have kept are important. Personal letters, maybe love letters that, that or, or, you know, communication that we have from families. These are all important, although they're, they're personal to you, but they, they help us create a complete history, a more holistic, not complete, but more holistic with more nuance uh, of Assyrian history of and Middle Eastern history in general, uh, deeds, special objects and so on. Um, in terms of projects, I'm engaged in projects in Iraq and uh, direct and, and collaborate uh, with projects. This is a really, really wonderful organization. The first issue I mentioned, I have an interview with uh, Archbishop Najib Mikhail uh, of, of the Chaldean Church in uh, Aqra and Musul. He's done a wonderful job. And, and the interview, if you if you get a chance to read it, uh, tells you about the importance of survival, even in the face of ISIS invading. In, they they manage to save and and collect the heritage and the stories that and I. Uh, some of them um, uh, I've, I've documented, but he's given many interviews where you can find um, um, really very heroic. Um, at UC, UC Berkeley, the Assyrian studies that, that was enabled by a generous um, grant from uh, Nora Lacey, the Abi Malik Bajul, uh, Yusuf Foundation has enabled us to also do some of this work. And we've had uh, individual donations, uh, donors as well to complement our archival practices. And, you know, the difficulty here is um, 
it's very challenging, and I'm sure that um, we'll hear more about this to to document um, and and to collect and to find a way of. Um, so what we had, what we did basically is uh, the collection that we're working on is through the Bancroft Library's uh, Western Americana collection. And given the sources that we have, we decided to stay close to Berkeley. So um, many organizations are helping, but hopefully with more funding, we can expand. But we're looking at the Western Americana collection, uh, basically migrant Assyrians uh, in California in the Bay Area. And we're including some, some collections. We hope to expand, but of course, this all depends on timing and our resources. Uh, so I think I'll stop here, Michael. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, and if I actually find one one last thing I want to point out here. So I mentioned the um, our theme, our approach of Western Americana, but I also want to add to it is that um, it, it's really important to think of a theme, particularly if your funding is limited, to think of a theme and and collect material. Um, sort of like writing an article or writing a book instead of just collecting everything you think you want to collect or would like to collect if you can just particularly focus on a theme this could help you with timing and and also um, with your budget and a lot of granting agencies uh, especially if you're going outside of the community they want to see a successful model this helps you having a successful model, even if it's a smaller model, to apply for larger grants and expand slowly. Sometimes archival projects fail, not because there isn't interest, but because they, they collect a lot of material, there isn't a specific theme, and they're not able to do it well, because it's, it's very expensive. That, that's the reality of it. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alda. I know that we've all learned a great deal, and I... Um... I can't wait for the discussion period to follow. Um, I'd like to turn the floor now to uh, Dr. Christopher Grafos um, and to uh, hear all that you have to say. Great, thank you for that, Michael. Just bear with me for one moment as I share my screen. Okay, I hope everyone can see my slide here. So my name is Chris Grafos. I'm currently the director of the HHF Greek Canadian Archives, as uh, Michael noted. We are in a bit of a moment of transition right now, and this presentation is going to reflect that. Before I jump into the presentation, however, I want to thank Egypt Migrations and Michael for the invitation to speak today. And you'll hear me speaking a lot about archives, our partners, Claire Thomas Archives and Special Collections at York University Libraries is a very intimate part of our process and organization here. And I'm gonna elaborate on what that has meant to the success of the HHF Greek Canadian Archives. And you'll see how these kinds of collaborations become very important to grassroots organizations. And I also wanna thank the Hellenic Heritage Foundation who has sponsored the Greek Canadian History Project um, and has turned it into the HHF Greek Canadian Archives. I will elaborate on what that all means and how this all came to fruition as well. I'd like to start with a story today in order to highlight the essence of the Greek Canadian Archives. And in order to tell the story, I wanna take you back to the initial moments of me being a graduate student. So there was a period between 2010 to 2012 where I continuously encountered a problem. You will note that many of the themes that I'm going to talk about were very obvious and stood out in all this presentation. I suspect that uh, we are going to have many uh, points of uh, commonality in the discussion following this presentation as well with each and every person that's in uh, attendance today. But the environment that I encountered was one where I was experiencing tremendous frustration because I was doing research on the Greek community in Canada. And in the existing archives, I kept seeing very similar things in that it was largely an institutional memory of officially organized Greek Canadian institutions that kept popping up. 
And what was very clearly absent to me was the history of the everyday. And that was the uh, story of Greek immigration to Canada that I was trying to capture. Now, similarly, in my department, when I was speaking with colleagues who were doing different kinds of historical research, I grew very frustrated that they could go to an archives for six months to a year and then have all of the materials that they needed for their dissertation. And so what was revealed to me was that if anyone was going to do a very robust history of Greeks in Canada, there needed to be a more complete archive. Similarly, while I was speaking with people and doing oral interviews, I kept encountering a problem that was outlined by Alda in that many people would say to me, Chris, I wish you had come to see me previously because I threw out all of my personal archive material that I had because no one in my family has an interest in it and I didn't think that it was going to be important to anyone. Or if it hadn't gone to that place yet, it was sitting in disrepair or you know, there was a potential for it to be thrown out or neglected because it was sitting in a basement or an attic, excuse me, an attic. So I could see that the writing was on the wall in that if there was nothing done in order to preserve these materials, that this very important piece of Greek immigrant memory in Canada was at risk of being purged forever and lost forever. I approached my then supervisor, Professor Sakis Gekas, who's the HHF chair of modern Greek studies at York University. I told him about this and uh, I'll go over some of the details here, which I can elaborate on in the question period if you want to know more. But we effectively got together and followed the model established by my then colleague, Gilberto Fernandez, who had started the Portuguese Canadian History Project at York University. Now, the reason why this is important is because we eventually partnered with the Clara Thomas Archives and Special Collections at York University. This is by far the most important collaboration that we made. And the people at the Clara Thomas Archives Special Collections, which I'll just refer to as Clara Thomas moving forward, they were, in my opinion, visionaries in that they looked at myself and my colleague, my then supervisor, Sakis Gekas, and said, you are the community experts. You know what is important to the community. And we are experts at preserving material and providing access to that material. And so the collaboration makes sense. So effectively what we did is we started collecting materials from private donors in our community and we cast a very wide net in order to capture as many kinds of stories and as many narratives from the Greek immigrant experience as possible. And then Clara Thomas would be in charge of the scientific preservation of those materials. So the one arm of the Greek Canadian History Project was to democratize and preserve the memory or items that spoke to the memory of Greek immigrants in Canada. And soon thereafter, we decided to incorporate a public history model, which would take these materials out of the archives and put them together in a curated fashion in order to share the materials with the public. And this was very effective as I'm gonna highlight some of the events that we've done. And it was a game changer with respect to the uh, sharing of knowledge related to Greek immigrant history in Canada. And it was a game changer with respect to getting a uh, really positive attention and community support for the archives. I'd like to call your attention to the second bullet point here in that this was a response to the dearth of material on Greeks in Canada. So as I mentioned, I think that there is an inherent bias in archives. I think that this is a very general point as well in that those who tend to donate their materials to archives tend to have some interest in legacy, whether it's for themselves or for their association. And so the work that we did really brought this to people who perhaps didn't see themselves as, as important enough to be preserved in an archive. And I thought that that was a real tragedy. And that was something that we really worked to change the nature of when it came to preserving many different kinds of stories and narratives of the Greek community. Uh, the uh, bottom point under the response to the dearth is the patron driven acquisition model, which was very important. Uh, and this is something that I briefly mentioned uh, earlier in that 
we would work with community partners in order to say your material is important and we'd like to preserve it. And so it was largely driven by a community and grassroots effort to preserve various materials that otherwise would have been thrown away. I want to highlight the last point on this slide here, which is that Michael mentioned that we have received a $1.4 million uh, donation in order to take the archives to the next level. Now, what that means is that we have collected thousands and potentially tens of thousands of material related to the Greek immigrant experience in Canada, but that material has been entered into a bottleneck. We don't have a Greek speaking archivist yet, and all of the things needed in order to take this to a more sustainable place really needed funding. Up until September of 2021, everything was completely bootstrapped. There was virtually no funding and the project was grown largely through collaborations. And we received a ton of support from Claire Thomas and other community partners, which was invaluable, but without any official donation, it was getting increasingly difficult to take the project to the next level. And so if someone wanted to come in and say, uh, take a look at various documents, oftentimes they had not been processed, they hadn't gone through the proper, ar proper archival mechanisms in order to be accessible and cataloged, and so there was a real bottleneck. Our partners at the Hellenic Heritage Foundation saw this, and we outlined the importance of what was happening at York, and they immediately jumped on board, which was great, and in September of 2021, the announcement of the $1.4 million donation to the Greek Canadian History Project, again, to be renamed to the HHF Greek Canadian Archives, occurred. And so I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that we are in a moment of transition, and this is why. So right now, we're in the midst of reworking our digital assets and everything in order to take us to the next iteration of this project. I promised that I would highlight the collaborations that have brought so much success to the project. And again, there is no project without a very important collaborations. This is a, an exhibition, one of our earliest exhibitions that we did in 2014. We partnered with many institutions and associations and one individual from the Greek community in Toronto in order to put this exhibition on. And this is in Toronto City Hall. So this is really an emblem of political power in our city. And we had the rotunda here for an entire week. That's all material related to the Greek immigrant experience. And so this really put the project on the map. Subsequent to that, we actually traveled to Greece and we did presentations in Thessaloniki, which is Greece's second largest city and the Canadian Institute in Greece, which is in Athens. And the experience there was overwhelmingly positive and it garnered a lot of international attention for the archives because in Greece, a lot of people um, soon started to see that what was happening outside of Greece, you know, these tended to be in, in silos or there were tremendous silences in the community, Greek community outside of Greece, and we were bringing that to light. We also started doing walking tours. Uh, this is a collaboration with Myceum of Toronto. Myceum takes the museum outside of the very typical brick and mortar mold and brings historical knowledge to people through walking tours and other very uh, interesting kinds of uh, presentations. And so we did a weekend long walking tour on the Danforth showing in photos there what the Danforth used to look like. For those of you who don't know, Danforth is the Greek town in Toronto. And so we showed a juxtaposition of what exists now and what existed in the past. You can see us here outside of the uh, church uh, in Greek town in Toronto. Uh, this was some of the corollary benefits. We got a lot of media attention for doing these kinds of collaborations. So, what is being built here is really of broader significance in that the problem that I encountered as a, an early graduate student was that there was no real pool or that the pool to draw historical knowledge from was very limited. And so the efforts that we have invested into growing the Greek archives at York University, I really envision this being a field for artists, writers, filmmakers, journalists, 
and even teaching undergrad courses, et cetera, uh, in order to build an infrastructure that will be used as a basis to build historical knowledge from. And it's my ambition and it's always been my hope that through these efforts, we can build a more complete understanding of the Greek immigrant experience and not one that is limited by institutional memory alone. And the broader point here is the bottom one here on the slide in that when I started doing research, what was very clear to me were that, was that there were enormous gaps in the history and this would never be filled unless something was created where an official memory or an official pool could be drawn from. Because as a professional historian, it's very difficult for me to go out into the public and say, this is the way that Greek immigrant life was, or this is what occurred. And my historical source is my uncle or my grandparent. And that just doesn't fly when it comes to uh, an historical discourse in, in academic life. Some of the gaps that we're trying to fill are working class life. You can see here, Greeks were involved in labor movements in Toronto. This is virtually non-existent in the academic literature related to Greek life in Canada, family life as well. One of the biggest missing components in the archive is women. Uh, the official Greek institutional memory tends to really privilege men. They were the ones who organized the institutions that primarily were put in place in order to preserve religious and cultural life. And so we're really trying to work in order to do a better job at preserving this memory. Uh, religion and public life. And so there are key moments that are virtually non-existent in the academic literature. You can see here, this is a collision of both Canadian and Greek immigrant life, because this is the iconic Maple Leaf Gardens where our beloved Toronto Maple Leafs, the hockey team of the city used to play. And you see here, this is an Easter mass and the entire stadium here, the arena is lit up by candles during the Easter mass. Again, uh, grassroots politics and labor has been an important part of this narrative which is non-existent in life. This is a, just a quick um, overview of uh, during Greece in uh, 1967 to 1974, there was a dictatorship. And so there were grassroots political mobilizations happening in Toronto and other North American cities. And this is what my dissertation focused on. And this was virtually unseen in the historical record up until this point, although people had these kinds of things. This is a hunger strike protesting the, in front of the Greek consulate, excuse me. Excuse me, this is a hunger strike in front of the American consulate in Toronto protesting what's happening in Greece. And so these kinds of memories, which are very important to Greek immigrant life, they were virtually silent in the academic literature. So I'll pause there. I would love to speak to any questions that may exist or highlight any part of this presentation that you found to be of interest. If you want to get in touch with me, my email is cgraphos at yorku.ca. And Michael, I'll throw it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, and uh, thank you both for such a wonderful and empowering presentations. Um, I know that um, I can speak from experience that what got me really uh, keen on uh, starting, uh, and the name might give it away, the Coptic Canadian History Project, uh, was my conversations with, um, uh, with Chris and with uh, Gilberto Fernandez, who founded the Portuguese Project. Um, and honestly, um, I credit uh, Chris and, um, and Gilberto for setting me on the path to now um, have this Egypt Migrations Project and to keep building forward. Um, and with that in mind, I think the big question that I would like to get us started with um, uh, for um, uh, discussion to both Alda and Chris is, okay, so how to get started? I mean, it can feel really overwhelming. It can feel uh, like, I don't know who to go to, where to go. I was fortunate, as I said, to be able to uh, go to uh, Jill and Chris at York University when I was doing my PhD. I had models there for me to speak with and to learn from. Um, and so 
what do, what do we do? <laughs> what, how do we start? Uh, any, any tidbits, any pieces of practical advice that you can give uh, to people that are thinking about preserving their community archive? And before, before you answer, let me just put this out there. Um, this is an open Q&A. Uh, we have these two experts for um, at least another 40 minutes, if not more. So uh, please, um, uh, for those joining us, uh, ask any question, uh, please feel free to type in the chat or to turn on your mic uh, or to engage in any way that you that you wish. All right, so I, I turn it back to you, Alda and Chris. Thank you, Michael. For me, uh, before coming to Berkeley, I already had um, a project in mind. I, I had at the Library of Congress uh, had been speaking with um, a digital archivist there and, and getting advice. I've been speaking to granting agencies to see what they would be funding, what advice they had. Uh, so, so I identified a theme. It was taken from my book project um, and uh, devised it in a particular way. And then when I got to Berkeley, I called um, Hamad Hamid, who's with us today, who is our wonderful librarian uh, with um, focus and expertise on the Middle East, um, and spoke to a lot of people. Uh, and then we had to work with the budget we had and um, speak with organizations. I think it's very important. This is, I of course identified what was uh, the, the um, what was missing, what, what needed to be, um, covered what needed to be sort of archived very similar to what Chris was talking about um, with uh, I was interested to see that there's all, all these similarities um, and I had a wonderful mentor advisor uh, still do Maria Mavrudi who is Greek by the way Chris so there's there's more connections between us and she understood the Assyrian experience and helped and open doors but um, I think having a librarian who understand the material and is on your side and wants to support you and, and you know and, and Berkeley is a very large institution with many libraries and then figuring out what is important to your local community. I think community engagement was very important. Um, take, you know, um, include them at the very beginning in these discussions. And then, um, you know, you, you really have to think about your time and your resources financially and what you can what you can do i came with a larger project but i learned that it would not be doable in in three years of the fellowship so i had to scale it down and and um and be happy with with that and then realize that you have time you know the, the, you don't need to do everything at the same uh in in a year or two so it, it takes a lot of time and digitization is very very expensive so um but I think bringing in archives slowly, having connections with the community, um, and then, you know, the issue of the archivist. I mean, we had to go outside of the community, uh, have additional funding, find an archivist, find not an official archivist, but somebody who could help us with the translations, uh, make it easy for the librarians who did not have Aramaic language skills to include that material in the library. And then realize this is a, a long and, and tedious process that we had to be careful how much material can we include uh given these resources and and giving the timeline that we had so th this this is my my advice i think but i'm sure chris would have a lot more they they're a bit more advanced a lot more advanced than we are i think that my advice would echo uh what you said alda i want to highlight a couple of things though so if you're asking yourself where to get started you're likely facing a couple of challenges and the most important ones are going to be money and resources. Certainly this was the case for me. And that's why my very uh, strong advice, and I would encourage you to do something that Alda mentioned here, and that is find allies who really believe in your cause and also find allies where there are clearly mutually beneficial collaborations possible. There is no way that this project would have received $1.4 million in funding without people giving a ton of sweat equity to the first nine years. Okay, we're in our 10th year now. The first nine years, again, we're, they were bootstrapped. So I come back to the incredible work and support that we have received from Claire Thomas Archives and Special Collections. 
if we had if we had to go and pay for those services out of our pocket, I don't even know what it would cost. I'm afraid to even ask that question. And we just simply wouldn't have the budget. Additionally, I think that when you're talking about memories of a community and you are an academic, I'm not sure what every community is like, but in some communities, I would imagine that there might be a little bit of a skepticism or antagonism about you coming in and appropriating material and taking it to a university, which may not be seen as a natural place for these items. So another challenge, in addition to resources that you may face, is one of tremendous skepticism. I think that if you approach this with honesty and integrity and you uh, do your best in order to show that your chief goal is preservation and providing access to these materials for time immemorial. You know, the one thing that I've always said is that while I've led this project, this is, I mean, my name, once I'm not part of the project, it's really not going to be anywhere. And it's the archive that's going to be the lasting thing. And that's a value well beyond my personal or even our, in this moment, our, our co collective importance. This is going to be something that's going to last well into the future. And so I think that those are the two chief goals that you may encounter when you are first starting. There are certainly ways to overcome that. Where to start, allies, and build your ability to have people to lean on because you will need people to lean on. And if you have a great team with you, then anything becomes possible. Thank you for the question, Michael. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to now, uh, with that, uh, turn to uh, everyone in attendance. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, comments, perhaps. I think I think I'll jump in. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chris and Alda, so much for this amazing uh, insight into just the, like all of the work that you've done. And something that I think really captured my attention about both of your presentations is that this sort of started when you were doing your doctoral work. Um, and so, you know, as someone who is going through that process right now, um, I was wondering if you had any tips, you know, for graduate students who, you know, in addition to kind of managing their own uh, projects um, are facing a lot of these perhaps gaps or um, learning how to interact with archivists and librarians for the first time, uh, perhaps some, some insight or tips that you would have for them as we are, I mean, of course, trying to navigate the, the COVID uh, research uh, environment, but as well as just, you know, what are some tips that we, you know, that you could give us as we are forming our projects and going into these archives and maybe seeing some of these opportunities um, as you both did. Thank you. Alda, do you want to go first? No, please go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I went first. Okay, so sure. Um, for me, I think uh, archivists and librarians are your best friend. It's difficult when you're learning, when you're working with a, with a community and you really want to do it justice and this community is marginalized and their language is not a majority language, right? And within the newly formed system, nation state, whatever you have. Uh, and of course, I'm speaking as a modernist, so I apologize to anyone who's working on earlier periods. Um, you, you, you deal with different languages, uh, languages that are not necessarily incorporated. You have to figure out a system for yourself to search, through, comb through the archives and find material um, that will somehow relate to you. I, I mentioned the Hoover Institution with the uh, the key terms not not really being uh, enough, not not um, with digitized archives, not picking up, not not everything was digitized, and and my community was not important enough. So so uh, there was a particular way that they crafted um, Iraqi history and 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 this archive, right? So um, speaking with with others. I spoke with Urid Bashkin, for instance, before going to Iraq, and she said, Alda, look, look for villages and towns where you know that there are a majority, the community that you're the Assyrians, and also look for names. And this was really great advice for me because um, 
for instance, I work with police records uh, and, and we found them and, and you know, names handwritten in what they called a, a daftar or a, a notebook uh, from the 1960s that were composed and, and thankfully preserved and, and uh, not burned uh, at the, in 2003 when the, when the archives uh, in Iraq was burned in Baghdad. Um, you know, I, I really had to go name by name and, and, and figure out what name could be possibly a Syrian, a neutral name, a Christian name, you know, and so, so you, you find all these different ways. And I think you really have to have uh, good connections with the community and organizations. Um, uh, find people to oral, oral, oral interviews for me were very important. Otherwise, I would not have given um, a history of the Assyrian community that was, um, you know, um, ethical and, and included different voices and it included women. So, uh, so oral histories were important, connections with the community, finding people, I mean, in tracking these people, especially my project was earlier, started 1960s to 1980s. So, so yes, some of them were alive, but from the 1960s, you had to work hard to find them. Um, and, and just being creative and, and convincing you, hopefully you have a wonderful advisor, but convincing them that, yes, I'm a historian, but it doesn't just have to be archival work. I can uh, complement it with, with music, with oral histories, with um, community produced material. And, and at that time in 2011, 10, 11, when I started my research, um, you know, you really, I mean, to, to build an archive of, of a particular magazine, you had to go to different sources, look for pri different private libraries and such. Somebody had three issues, somebody had two issues, piece them together. Um, th this is, um, this is, you know, the, and the challenge continued just when my book was ready to be published and we had to decide on a picture. It was nearly impossible to find a picture that I wanted to tell, you know, um, the history that I wrote, a picture that's fitting my book, right? Um, and it was very difficult. I had to think of an event, then think, uh, then find out who was the organizers of this 1959 event. Um, and, and I found out that there was four people who organized it in the 1950s. All of them had were not around, of course. Some of them had children. I had to track the children and the grandchildren. And like Chris mentioned, one man I called, he said, you know what? I, I sold my house, I live in an apartment, and I got rid of all my archives. I had them, I had what you needed. Finally, I found a man in New Zealand who had his father's album, right? And, and you know, so so I was able to track that, but it was it was a process. From the very beginning to the very, very end, it was difficult. So so this is a challenge that we, we are facing, and I think we need to find an answer to, because we just cannot rely on these institutions of the way the new nation state was formed, was took these institutions to create a national history and and created archives and we the communities that we studied had been left out so we we have more than a hundred years of, of you know catching up to do basically um and, and that's a problem that we're facing but um hopefully we, there there are success stories here and there amy that's a great question I will go back. Uh, I think that there's a two part answer for me. I will go back to something that Alda said and something that I mentioned previously. I think that finding allies are, is very important and it's true. I will echo what Alda said as well. Librarians and archives are your best friends. They share a passion for what historians do and they have a completely different skill set, which really complements what we do. So I think that that's an absolute must. The second thing, if I were to go back now and speak to my to a younger version of myself and uh, speak to myself in the position that you're currently in, the one thing that I would probably say, uh, tell myself and say to you right now is that it's okay to trust yourself. And when I started uh, the project, what I realized is that uh, a lot of people may not see your vision of what you're building. And they may not see the importance of it, but a lot of people will as well. And so keep those people close to you, help you get, get help in building your vision of the archives project that you want to build. And whoever doesn't see it initially, they will once you've built it. And I think the, the old adage, if you build it, they will come. I absolutely believe in that because there is still there's so many riches and gems out there in every community and every subject that we study and so i think that when you collect them tell a story 
and showcase the importance of these items, it's just naturally alluring. There's something organic about it and it starts to pull people in together. And so that magnetism is something that takes one person to start building and, and creating. I saw this happen with Michael after I built it. And I remember us having a very similar conversation. And uh, I remember offering this advice to Michael when he was kind of just starting out as well. That's what I really believe. You know, I think that it takes one person to really uh, start pulling in other people. And then from there, it's the collaborations that help expand it tremendously. Hope that helps. Uh, yeah, Marie, you have a question? Yeah, sorry, my um, laptop decided to close. But um, thank you both for your presentations. Um, I, I agree with the allure. I think I was like uh, someone who like saw Michael build this and was really excited about what he was building and see its benefits and see its growth and see also how much courage it took to like really pursue um, the vision that he had um, especially like against like so many um, difficulties that I like witnessed him go through. Um, but I have two questions. One is really quick for you, Aldo. Um, what was the woman singing about? Um, and then uh, the other one, which I, um, maybe it's a bit rambly, but um, I was wondering about like, what could we do now to guard against some of the challenges you face studying history? Um, and I know that um, I know that one thing, for example, from listening to like Michael and Michael, maybe you can jump in and talk more about your experience. But like one thing that was a challenge is getting people to trust you with their archives, um, especially in a context where there's not much like trust in institutions or there's not much awareness of like what even academics do or where are these archives? What does archives even mean? Um, and so like what is something that could be done now to guard against like to guard against some of this for like future researchers, but also for future community members to have access or more access to, to more materials. Um, I think that's my question, yeah. Thank you, uh, Mariah. So uh, she is singing about her village um, and how she felt living in, a, in an empty village. Um, she mentions the Church of St. George, Margi Vargas, uh, nobody celebrating Mass. Um, she thinks about the young men and women that were, I'll get emotional, <laughs> uh, that were, um, would, would stroll the streets of the village. Um, and then she asked uh, that she would not die here without any service. So, and she is saved. So, so you know, um, it, very sad. Um, and I'll let uh, Chris maybe respond and I'll go back to you. Sure. Thank you, Alda. You know, I have to say that I think music transcends language because it, uh, the emotion in her voice was coming across and it was making me emotional just listening to it, even though I couldn't understand, but it was very clearly uh, meaningful. Uh, okay, so to get to the point about gaining trust, this was a huge obstacle that uh, our project faced initially. And there's no easy answer to this. I think that being persistent, in my case, having coffees with people um, at their kitchen table on many occasions and uh, showing that you are there with a sincerity that and a meaning that transcends your, your own interests, your own personal interests. I remember in the very few, in the first few speeches that I gave in a public setting related to the project, I always had this line that I would like to conclude with. And it was something like, you know, we are, we're seeking to enrich our community and not personally get rich because I think that uh, the perception was, you know, why are, why do you want my stuff? What are you going to do with it? And before we could do public events in order to show you know, kids looking at this, uh, older members of the community coming and seeing themselves in this narrative that we were telling. Without those tangible items to showcase what we were doing, it was very difficult to gain trust. So I think you have to show some grit in, the, in those early moments and 
start building things of value, and then people will become uh, more comfortable with being a part of what you're building. Um, I think that you have to really get through those moments and say, hey, we're not here to, you know, engage in um, funny business here. We're building something serious and long lasting. Um, and I think people will, will be more comfortable with participating if you do that. Uh, Mariah, if I can just add, there, there is, um, people are attached to these memoirs that family have left behind, especially if that person has passed on. So I'm speaking to a woman whose husband has passed away uh, and he was an important um, intellectual. And she's, you know, she w understands the idea of donating this material, but this is all she has left of him. You know, so you have to think about, I mean, again, the librarians can guide you, archivists can guide you, maybe you convince these people that think, of, maybe you can digitize and return to them. Of course, libraries want to have um, the objects, right? It, it's important to also have the art, not, not just the digital material, but there could be ways of maybe convincing the libraries um, and the person digitized, but you donate it after your passing, put it in your will, something like this. For particular cases, I think you have to come up with sort of uh, these, these solutions. I mean, it, and understand that this material, yes, it's, it's good for our, our uh, collection and, and for preserving our heritage and all that, but for these people, it means a lot. Uh, it's significant. Um, in fact, there is, we are hosting a workshop, uh, Digital Humanities um, Community Engagement that I've organized with the Center of Middle Eastern Studies uh, next Friday. Michael, I can send you the, the, the link and, and share it with you. So um, um, Hegnar Watampa is going to be joining us and she'll be talking about uh, Armenian manuscripts and, and what do they, the meaning of them, not only for you know, these museums, but for the people, for the communities, as is important, ob they're not just objects, right? So, so I think I agree with Chris, you have to show the, in general, you have to be sincere. Um, and there's also power relations, you know, for women, um, your status, uh, how you present yourself, how the community perceives you, are you sort of a traditionally accepted scholar or a person, all, all the, I mean, there's a lot of power relations at play, and, and for some, it will be easier than others, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's a reality, um, but, you know, being genuine, showing that, and, and this is why I think if you scale your project, you start with something small, and you show them, like, look, I was successful, and I can do this, then you'll get more people donating, so, um, I think that's that's how we have to play it. Yeah, thank you both, and thank you, Marie, for for the great question. Uh, yeah, you and I have had many, many, many conversations about uh, the challenges and and you know the successes we've also seen uh, in getting people to to donate their material. Um, and I'm speaking from my own experience. I know that um, uh, on that last point that Alda made regarding. Um, um, digitization and then eventually collecting the original material archives do prefer the original material and that creates certain obstacles for people who are not so comfortable uh with uh giving up the originals but you come up with alternatives you figure out solutions with uh the communities and you show like chris said you show the success that you've had you show tangible proof of that work that you're doing um and how it benefits the community and it makes a difference um, and it, regarding uh, digital materials, so our last question for today uh, comes from um, uh, Ruth Camber. Um, I will read it out uh, for you, and then uh, you can go ahead and, and answer uh, in whatever order you choose. Um, may I ask about digital preservation and storage? Is there a particular software and storage space you use, or do you house the documents and represent what is in the archive through a catalog? Regarding the periodicals or personal documents, how did you add or initially catalog them so that others who search may find the contents? Uh, this is a great question. It is something that is immediately pertinent in our endeavor here because we are right now speaking with the university about what the mechanisms are going to be for digital storage and so we are lucky to have a budget to make it happen but it is very expensive and so we don't quite know what limits are 
going to be placed on this right now. The chief goal for the materials that we have amassed currently is to get them cataloged in a traditional sense so that the content is searchable. Currently, because we were very successful at getting materials, we have a huge backlog. And so if someone wants to come in and actually look at the materials, they cannot look at most of the items that we have uh, taken in. And so it's really a priority to get something that's searchable and allow the items to be findable. So the digitization from our perspective is largely going to happen through uh, curated exhibits. And so we're not going to, I think, uh, focus on digitizing entire collections, uh, but rather parts of collections and then doing some type of public history overlay over those items. So I don't have a full and robust answer to that question right now because we are working through the complications associated with digitization, but I hope that that's at least uh, some entry point for you, Ruth. Ruth, I just want to add also that copyright issues is a problem. So I, I, you know, I talked about my interest in uh, or the, the curation fitting within a particular, you know, uh, area history, but also I, I have a particular theme uh, and it, it involves the 20th century, right? So not everything you'll be able to it's quite complicated. You need to get copyrights. You need to make sure. And, and who is responsible for this material? Can they actually sign off? Um, it's a lot of, so digitization is, is really wonderful, but actually getting it through, it's very expensive and, and you will not be legally allowed to display everything anyways. So it's, it's quite challenging. And access is, I mean, digitization is wonderful because of the access. You want to give the community access. So you have to sort of figure something out. If I may ju just jump in on that, Alda, something that you said uh, sparked something that's quite important as well in that if you are working with community members, the donors of the material, they hold a lot of power over what is going to be digitized or what can be digitized. And you have to ask these questions of the people giving you the materials, because if they don't feel comfortable with that, then they will they can potentially put a clause in whatever donor contracts that they're signing with the archives. So that this is not possible. On the other hand, some people say, I would love to have it digitized. Can we work something out so that when we do donate it, it is accessible to the world. So you get all sorts of reactions and levels of comfort from donors when it comes to digitizing the materials that they are donating. And uh, oral history, if I can just add to that. So I, I talked about its importance, but it's very, very complicated, not only in terms of transcriptions, but uh, getting uh, the right permissions, having, uh, I think, Ruth, you've done a lot of oral, oral interviews, so, so this is not a response to you, but in general, uh, those who are not familiar with the process, you need to have um, institutional review board approval. Um, in the U.S. and in Canada and in most most places, um, and and uh, the if you do not have the if you do not have not gone through that process and if you do not have the person's permission to put it online or even use it um, or or have it accessible to scholars not only to see or hear but also to use. There's a lot of like um, there's a lot of legalities that you need to go through. I. Even with music, I mean, we had we had uh, this wonderful collection of music that we wanted to include, but but uh, because of copyright issues, because of digitization and how, how it was done, uh, it became very difficult. So so these are important questions. So digitization is has all these pluses, but then it comes with with complications that you need to work with. Great, thank you so much, thank Alda and Chris. Uh, oh, thank sorry, you I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I appreciate any feedback and um, I appreciate the work that you have done. Um, I think it's incredibly important and I live and breathe it. So thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ruth, for your question. Thank you, um, Alda and Chris, for sharing your expertise. Um, and for sharing uh, all of this uh, really important advice with us. Uh, we have um, 
our third webinar, the third and final webinar, uh, coming uh, next um, month or tentatively April 1st on uh, oral history. Uh, so it's a great follow-up, thank you Alda, um, to go on to talking about best practices, uh, practical advice for how to get started, um, and also technical advice because uh, speaking from uh, much, much experience, technical issues can be a stumbling block and can even be daunting at first for, for getting started. Um, and uh, just to let you know, yes, so our first webinar on archives is up on YouTube, um, on the Egypt Migrations YouTube channel. Um, and we also have uh, the Egypt's Migrants in the Gulf, uh, an oral history exhibit uh, up and available on the site now. Uh, and uh, to add on to our many uh, initiatives, um, we have a discussion with uh, an Egyptian Canadian filmmaker uh, who produced a short film on a Coptic family's experience during um, the Egyptian revolution in 2011 here in Mississauga, uh, Ontario. And that discussion with the director will be happening uh, on March 4th uh, over Zoom as well, and will be recorded and made available on Egypt Migration's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, lots to be excited about, lots to look forward to, um, and lots to celebrate when we talk about the power of community archiving and of preserving counter narratives. Um, and I thank you all for coming. Um, and with that, we'll conclude and wish you a very happy weekend.